All right, the theme for um, Harvest has been creativity, which you've seen on the communion table and in the banner and in all of the workshops that we did at um, the retreat. Um, in fact, in many, in many ways around the church, we see the, the creativity of our members. And today we see creativity playing out in some of our writers. So you see Melody and Susan and Mark and Pat, and we're sorry that Don Allen and Roxana and, oh, and Mary Lou's on the screen. Hello, Mary Lou. <laughs> uh, Don Allen couldn't join us, uh, nor Anne Held, uh, nor Roxana. So we're missing each one of those, but uh, we have everybody else. So I've asked each of them to speak about their inspiration, what inspires them to write and to be a writer and how that plays out in their lives. And we'll start with Melody. I'll give you the hot seat. Hi. Yeah. And I get the hot seat because we have to leave early. There's a funeral in Timberville that we really wanted to go to from a, a Lion Club member. Um, well, the questions that Judy gave us started with Have you always been a writer? And <laughs> it was an interesting question. I was going to say, I, I tried nursing. <laughs> a, 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 what do they call them? The, the pinstripe girls in high school. Okay. And I had it for two weeks and I, I knew I wasn't cut out for nursing. Um, teaching, I did a year of uh, teaching in Kentucky with preschoolers and I enjoyed it very much. I enjoyed the children. I just didn't like preparing the next day lessons, right? <laughs> anyway, waitress, house cleaning, and so on. But my seventh grade English teacher, I'm going to say, really maybe turned on that button for me. Um, I probably did some writing in elementary school and at home, but um, she, we had an um, uh, assembly, the whole school, uh, but high schoolers and middle schoolers, and there was, they brought in uh, persons that were in, uh, yeah, in jail, in prison, whatever, and did a presentation trying to scare us all straight, right? Not to um, um, go get into crime like they had. And um, the teacher asked us to write about our impression from that. And I did, I wrote a piece and uh, she sent it unbeknownst to some of us uh, to the local newspaper. And my piece got printed when I was in seventh grade. And so that, that uh, was, was fun. And I also enjoyed many different kinds of writing through the years. Um, the, uh, some of my books that came out earlier and they are still in the church library, or at least maybe some of them, uh, would we, today we would call them memoirs or you know, uh, of a year's time, the year that I spent in Spain, um, as a student, that was a book that I was able to put together clear back in the 80s. And this was when I was teaching in Kentucky on Troublesome Creek, where say, or in the exact same area that had a lot of flooding trouble this year. Um, and then just uh, this one is a, was called the devotional, Why Didn't I Just Raise Radishes When We Were Raising Children? You know, that was my <laughs> response to that. But um, more recently, um, the book that I'm talking about a little bit today is called Memoir of an Unimagined Career because you know when you're trying to become a writer, it's very hard to make a living as a writer. As a writer. Um, none of my books have sold <laughs> anything near to being a bestseller, but it, uh, the work that I was able to do at Mennonite Media which is talked about in this book uh, where I worked for 43 years. Um, and when my first inspiration about mm, really cementing my um, interest in being a writer, we lived on a farm and we had a big chicken house and I love to talk to the chickens and they talk to me and they, yeah. <laughs> anyway, one day after, I, <laughs> this is an interesting day. And I wrote this down, honest to goodness, right after I came out of the chicken house. On this date, November 18, 1967, Saturday afternoon at 4.30 p.m., I decided what I want to be. I want to be a Christian writer. And I put that in there. I'm not sure, just because of, yeah, we were very much churched and that was um, on my 
on my um, mind. Um, now I say that I do writing to process life, right? You know, things happen. <laughs> Our dog got hit with a skunk spray last night and things happened and Stuart and I had a real fun time trying to get that dog cleaned up, <laughs> especially with Stuart's uh, recent surgery. So anyway, um, I'll probably be writing about that. Um, then the kind of writing, what, one of the questions um, Pat asked was, uh, Judy asked, why did I say Pat? I'm on the spot. Um, is, I, you named the kind of writing and I've done it. I've done marketing writing, I've done reports galore, I've done uh, working on documentaries for the organization Mennonite Media. And these documentaries came because of some connections our directors had, uh, were aired on ABC and NBC. You, if you were around here for a while, you might've remembered um, hearing about those. They did air locally. Uh, wonderfully challenging work it was to work on those documentaries because that's not something you set out to do by yourself. It was a whole team of people, different people interviewing different people. I talk about that in this book. So that's, um, that's uh, let's see, what else? Do a newspaper column, a blog now, um, did um, a lot of different kinds of writing for radio, like I said, for television, short spots, radio spots, public service announcements from the Mennonite churches. Um, you used to hear those on the air. Now I will say the, organization that I used to work for, which was Menno Media, it kind of uh, got taken over by the publishing house. And now it's more, I mean, they do do a podcast and other, you know, vi visual uh, communications now, um, but it's not so much in radio and TV and all that. Okay. Books, they're, they're you know, they're publishing books uh, and Sunday school materials. And the little uh, Bible school, not the Bible school, the children's Bible story book that's up in the kids' room um, came from uh, Menno Media. Um, the last question I think I'll speak to, and then we're gonna need to scoot out. Um, <clears throat> what is the most satisfying aspect of writing? <clears throat> I was this way, and I'm sure you, if you went to school and college and whatever, uh, it was always, the best part was getting done with the project, right? <laughs> Finishing writing, whatever it is that inspired you, inspired me in the beginning. Uh, it was a wonderful feeling. You felt like you were walking on air. And, and so that is to me, maybe an, similar in other fields of creativity, whether you're making a painting and uh, it's finally done. We had one up there earlier. Um, yeah, I think I've spoken enough. I'm going to leave some of these books here on this extra chair. And if anybody wants one, you, uh, you can leave, take a book and whatever. I did sign them. Um, if you wanna, there's a, I'll leave the, an envelope. Let me see. In my uh, cubby out there. Yeah, the mailbox. And if anybody wants to, to buy them, they're 14. Um, they're a little bit more than that online. Um, so a little bit of a bargain. And I'm, I will watch this recording. This is being recorded, right? Um, and so I'm anxious to hear what the rest of my Thank you, Trinity folks Thank you. have to say. Yes, it is. Let me get it. Is there someone who would volunteer to go next, or shall I select? You select. All right, Pat, you'll need to be in this chair. Oh, okay. And then, Mary Lou, I think we'll ask you to go next because I know you're not feeling great and you might like to be at the beginning. Give me a minute. I feel humble following um, follow, following such a, a renowned writer. 
because I am not. Uh, my first poem I wrote when I was around six, and it was about the wonders of the sleet storm <laughs> it was that, that had hit Richmond, and I had never seen sleet, and I thought it was amazing. I don't have it, but I just remember, um, and I was amazed at the sleet storm. And um, the second poem I wrote was about our sailboat. It was called the Black Turn. And we kept it on the Great South Bay when we lived in Babylon, Long Island. And um, I sent the poem to Seventeen Magazine and they sent me $7. <laughs> I was so thrilled. <laughs> My first paying position was director of photography and publications at Bridgewater College, which involved writing and editing the alumni journal and overseeing the sports information writer, who at one time was Bruce Elliott. <laughs> uh, he was a good fellow. He is a good fellow. When I quit, I was paid the money that went into my retirement. And I decided to go to Europe for three weeks with my son, Chad, who asked to come along. We both kept journals, some of which I incorporated into my autobiography, which I have just finished. My granddaughter, Elise, is editing the photo placement. So at least she said she will. I, I contributed to my daughter Beth's book, both editing and photographs, about a year in her life. And I edited her edited her 30 or so other books. Um, and lastly, I wrote a book um, called Don't Stop Believing in Love about the journey I took with Chad through and after his head injury and two and a half month coma. It was rejected. I was told because it didn't have a happy outcome. He got better, he could walk and work and hug and love, but that wasn't enough for the publishers. So it is, it's, I have it at home. <laughs> it was quite an effort and I felt very relieved after it was finished because I thought I'd really accomplished something. Felt more relieved than when I finished my autobiography because I figured nobody would want to read my autobiography. But my son John says he will, so <laughs> he may or may not. I think he was just being kind. <laughs> but at least I have one reader. Um, since he can't be with us, I brought some of Charles' books of poems. You are welcome to them if you would like. I'll read a few of them in closing um, because. Um, here's one, it's called Jesus, Jesus. When some stranger asks, are you saved? What would you do? I could say, I've been saved by Jesus, have you? It was a Mexican working on our place whom the Lord must have used to administer grace. Working alone on my roof on a cold March day, I fell through the rafters and there all bloody I lay. When Jesus found me, that sounds just like the hymn, and maybe it was him. I didn't see the halo when they carried me away. But it was interesting because later on, Trinity had a group of a few Mexicans, and Jesus was one of them. And Charles said, oh, I know you. You're the one who saved my life. And so, and Jesus was quite surprised that, that was true. Here's one called Musing. Heavy mist masses in the mountains where yesterday sunlight lay in yellow pools. From my heated office, I merged westward to a fallen moss matted hemlock, light green and sheltered grayness. There reclining on rich red rock under the ferns, I had made with my small pocket cushion for the middle of my back. And one more. It's called, Oh Lord. Wherever I see man's inhumanity to man, 
policemen gunned down while performing their accustomed duties, storekeepers robbed, women raped, Jews fighting Muslims, Muslims murdering Jews, Libyans threatening war, and Hindus massacring Indian villagers, children torn and bleeding, crying in the night, forsaking peace. Our government seeks uncertainty, uncertain security, primarily in deadly arms. How desperate our pursuit of peace and how futile our efforts to achieve it. Yet, O oh Lord, we place our hopes, our world, all that we love in your hands within the grasp of one who yearns for all health, wholeness, and joy. And if anyone wants these books, you're welcome to them. I'll put them here with melodies. Some magic here. Can you say a few words just so we can make sure we can hear you? E, e, yes, good morning. <laughs> good so so judy asked if i have always been a writer um certainly i've been a letter writer a note writer probably most of my life um it's a entirely different kind of writing but it's a kind of writing that brings me joy um i probably started journaling personally um, in 1984, probably uh, about the time that Chalice was fired, um, and that was a way of processing um, all that was happening to us at that time. Uh, but I began writing poetry a couple of years after I retired, um, kind of as I allowed myself to slow down and enter a different rhythm of life then these words just began to bubble up within me in amazing and pretty surprising ways. Um, and they reflect the rich experiences of my life, some quite ordinary and some extraordinary. Uh, I was in Charleston, South Carolina, visiting a friend and sharing in the Spoleto Festival, which is a vast array of music and art opportunities um, for one to enjoy, and we went to a piano concert. A young Japanese, Yusuke Kamura, was playing. And when I was just so moved by his performance that when I came home, I wrote this poem. And this was probably the, the first poem that I really put on paper. It was as if a magnet had pulled him to it. He sat, touched it ever so gently, then slowly, gracefully invited it to join him and the two became one, man and piano united. United as he, Yusuke, caressed the keys into motion with fingers and feet, fingers flying across the keys, pounding, plucking, gently touching, all in an invitation to life, to the music that emerged and filled the space with such beauty vibrating in one's soul. United, man, piano, us, spellbound, held in this holy space, filled with beauty, with grace, awed into stillness by his life giving music and the oneness of it all. When the last note fades, will we, can we take it with us, this gift of grace, beauty, oneness? Um, so on that, for that same trip, my friend Mary Lou, who I was visiting, had a copy of Mary Oliver sitting on an end table. And I picked that up and I was so touched by her, her the simplicity of her writing that she could just write about the simplest of things. And I found when I got home, I began to just notice um, ordinary things that brought joy and brought um, beauty into my life. And so one of those first early poems I wrote was about the robin. It was uncommonly beastly hot this June day, yet she, 
the envy of her feathered friends, and me too, for that matter, had settled midst the splashing coolness of the water as it tumbled playfully, refreshingly to the pond below. I almost missed her at first, so still, immersed in the water, she sat, fluffed out, her red breast soaking up the coolness. Then she ducked her head, fluttered her wings, splashing, delighting, and settled again. Others came and went. For now, it was her space, no room to spare. I watched in wonder and awe as she flicked and fluttered, splashing in utter delight, till at last she flew, cooled, refreshed, the robin. Um, so, um, so yeah, things just kept bubbling. I wrote about the morning dew, I wrote about spider webs on bushes, um, and it just became a way of, of, of observing the things around me and bringing them to expression. Um, she asked what compels us to write, and I think it's out of the silence often of retreat. I normally do a silent retreat in Advent and Lent, um, and on my morning walks, the, the deep feelings and emotions that rise up and are often best expressed in a poem. It's a way of helping me process something that's happening in my life, kind of sorted out the emotional response, express the inner conversation that's going on. Um, my poetry is simple, free verse, no training, no know-how. Um, the words just emerge and fall into place, sometimes better than others. Um, so the book I published on my own um, is Songs of My Soul. Um, and I did it primarily to, to share it with my family and my closest friends um, uh, so that they would, because it does reveal a lot of my own inner thoughts and feelings and emotions. And I thought in days to come, they may care about having that. Um, who knows? I'm like Pat. Um, my children also invited me a couple of years ago to do this storybook uh, program, and I don't remember the exact name of it, but every week I got a prompt to write a story about some aspect of my life. And so I did that. Um, and that was kind of fun, and that was brought back a lot of memories. Um, and supposedly, it will get put together in a book you know, format sometime to share with the children and the grandchildren. Um, but, um, so that's something I've done in the last year. Um, the most satisfying aspect of writing is that it seems to express a deep piece of me that otherwise would remain dormant. It's a way of processing feelings and emotions that is meaningful and it's awfully deeply personal and revealing. I often, um, I often discover something about myself after I've written something. And when others resonate with something that I've written and it has meaning for them as well, then that's quite satisfying. Um, I write from my own need for expression, but if it touches another, then that's the extra bonus. Um, the sharing of notes and letters and such is just pure joy because it's a way of staying connected uh, with people that I love. Susan, can I ask you to come next? Oh, you're wearing a, an appropriate. <laughs> you're right, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. Well, for those of you who don't remember me, I haven't been here for a while. I'm Susan Easto. Um, I have thank yous to Melody Davis for supporting me and uh, to write my little book. I feel kind of out of place with all these good writers, but my book is Dragonfly, Light Gently. And um, as far as, uh, I don't have any notes with me because I have visual problems. Uh, so if somebody wants to read 
the questions. Oh, and can, I can, well, or I can just add mind. lib. Okay. Um, I think uh, the first time I ever wrote anything, it was in high school and it was a very brief couple paragraphs. Uh, we were asked to, to go see the movie, Dr. Zhivago. And I love that movie, uh, not just the, the beauty of uh, photography of the, um, the landscapes and everything uh, in Russia, but the, um, the story itself. And um, so I wrote something about that. And um, that's when I really first started writing. Um, I think the, the next things that I put into words were just um, journaling. I did quite a bit of journaling uh, during college and uh, after. I really started writing in my mid to late 40s. And I started writing short stories about things that happened in my life. Uh, that I remembered as a child and then other things, darker times in my life that I was going through a lot of uh, emotional turmoil uh, for several years. And, and I felt like I needed to express that. And when I could get it out on paper, it was there in front of me and it was like I could um, let it go. It was kind of a release for me. It was a healing process. Uh, and if any of you has read my, my little book of poems and short stories, you know it's a very <laughs> pretty much brutally honest um, poetry and, and stories about my, my life. Um, the dragonfly, when I was younger, um, I loved dragonflies. I just thought they were mys mystical creatures and and I just would go up to the pond on my, my grandparents' farm and I would sit there and watch the dragonflies light down on the, the plants and in the pond. And I just uh, watched them move and how, how graceful and how almost transparent they were, but how strong they were, how in a, just a few seconds they could turn and just be gone. And I kind of related that to um, characteristics of myself because uh, I needed to be strong. I needed in my life to um, be determined um, and be able to flee when I felt unsafe. And um, that's the drink. That's the dragonfly, uh, if, you, if you've read it, that's kind of what it symbolized to me. Um, and I, I really have enjoyed my writing and especially getting this together. Uh, it took years to really put it together <laughs> and put my artwork in there. Um, I used to love doing artwork and now with my vision failing, um, it's harder to do, but uh, I still write when I can. I have, uh, I live at VMRC and I have uh, the volunteer coordinator type things for me and I can't type, I can't use a computer, but um, they type my uh, writings and I appreciate it so much. And they always comment on, you know, my writing in a positive way. And so I gave, the um, volunteer coordinator of one of my books also. Um, Susan, could you open it to a page that has some artwork on it? And, and what's that? It? Could you open here? Could you open to a page that has some of your artwork and hold that up so we can see that? Okay. The um, this is one about, um, it's the, um, my personal coat of arms. 
I don't know if I'm holding it just right. Let's see if we can see if I can figure. And there we go. You see the trend. And um, I can't, by memory, I can't remember all of what it symbolized, but each part of it symbolized parts of my life and my faith and everything. Um, this one in my healing. Um, Am I doing it right here? Yeah, I can tell by looking up on them. Um, the big hand symbolized my hand. The little one is my inner child when we connected. And that's when my healing started. You want me to read anything from it? Uh, can you, can you see it well enough to read or would you like me to um i would have i would be here for a while okay. if i had to read it but i do have one thing that um you could read um i'm not sure if it's right in the back I, I went through the loss of my mother, who was my last family member last October, and I wrote some things. Um, yeah, if you could read that one. Top? Okay. And this is about an experience I had with a cardinal that I felt like God sent to me during my grieving times, during a really hard time in my life. Uh, grieving my mother before even she died. All right, she says, during the seven months, my mother was bedfast and on hospice at a local nursing home. A female cardinal appeared outside my window on a ledge below. She tweeted her sweet song day after day, and I whistled to her and talked softly to her. The cardinal came every day, except the day my mother passed. When I got to the nursing home, my mother had passed away 10 minutes before I arrived. My friend from church took me, and as we sat down and I said goodbye to my mother, I heard a chirping outside my mother's window. It was a female cardinal. I cried. I said to my friend, the cardinal wasn't at the window this morning, but she came to my mother's. It was as if God sent her to comfort me and to let me know he had taken my mother to heaven. I'm still grieving for my mother as I need to. I recently thought if I had five more minutes with my mother before she died, I would have sat on the side of her hospital bed and held her in my arms until she took her last breath, just as she held me when I was born and took my first breaths. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anything else anybody wants to ask me? Or... Well, I think let's let Mark go and then we can have questions at the end. Okay. Um, I have this extra book if anybody hasn't. Got it if, if you would like it. Thank you, all of you, for bringing your work. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Mark's going to talk to us, and he's not going to ask for money. At least I don't think so. <laughs> well, this, this book is actually 1995. You can get it on Amazon. Um, um, I, I, I want to start by something that I think is kind of interesting about storytelling. I was there when we met Jesus, and I do not remember Charles saying that. I remember Pat saying in her sure, strong voice, you saved my husband's life, right? That's how it actually happened. Or, or it didn't, what I'm getting at is what makes the better story, right? And I think part of what happens- I remember Charles saying that. I remember Charles saying I remember Pat saying, yeah, okay, you remember it as Charles, yeah, <laughs> well, obviously I'm right, no, it, 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 I, another thing I remember about it is also the fact that it was clear to everyone that when he did save Charles' life, his English was not very strong, and shall we say, his papers were not all in order, mm -hmm. that he stepped out of his own self-concern, okay, 
uh, for someone else. And I think really did live, live up to his name. Now, you see, this is the kind of fight I always got in with my mother. She'd go, she'd read something I'd written, and she says, that was 1963, not 64. <laughs> um, anyway, my, my, my writing life, has it, it does go back a long way. I, I wrote a novel when I was in uh, fourth grade, and uh, my dad was typing it. And it was a novel about a man It was, uh, hey, I mean, handwritten, it was a good 50, 60 pages. And my dad was typing it up for me, right? And it got to the point where my protagonist had left his wife and three children, right? For an entire year and gone out West to start a farm. And when he got back, his fourth child was born, right? And, and my dad said, wait a minute, right? We got home just in time for the birth of his fourth child. And, and my dad said, we, we, we need to talk about a few things. <laughs> what exactly are you getting at? So that I guess what I would say, if I, if I, I, writing for me has been a way of finding myself, finding my way into things that I want to understand. And it has served lots of different functions in my life. Uh, from that early effort to, you know, to, to create a story that's someplace else, to uh, um, trying to tell the truth about my own reality. There have been things, too, that people have read. They said, oh, I want to read something of yours. I found this. And then they read it and they go, what the heck are you talking about? Because much of my writing actually had to do with my academic life. And it was written um, with, an, with incredible density for a very small audience. Right. And if somebody tried to see it, you know, as something else, like some of the stories I've published, then uh, then, then they went, wait a minute, does, does it even come from the same uh, brain? I, I don't know that if it does or not. The other thing I think that's very important for me in my writing is how much of uh, how deeply connected it is to my my my, my teaching. Uh, and in fact, that's why I brought this. Um, I know of three instances where former students of mine have used me as a character in fiction or in this in this right here i'm actually I'm given a portrayal um as as an actual professor the guy matt bondurant he wrote the novel the wettest county uh that was the basis for the movie lawless which was one of the most <laughs> violent movies ever made his 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 uncle's generation they were the biggest bootleggers in Nelson County. And Nelson County was indeed the wettest county in the, in the, in the country uh, during Prohibition. And so he put me, he put me in him, one of his novels, right? And uh, I, I read it and I go, really? I'm, I'm that mean? <laughs> you know? Or I'm, I'm, I'm that hard on students? Uh, they, all, they all keep coming back to that, right? And, and so there's this one. The other thing, and this is where, let me, let me really, Get, get serious here for a second. This, this is not my book. This book is by uh, Jennifer Orth Veillon, right? She married a Frenchman. Um, and um, it is, she's a former student of mine. And she's a former student of mine putting together a book on a subject that's dear to my heart or that's very important to me, which is the, uh, not just the, the fact of the Great War, the First World War, but it's aftermath. And this, so this is a book that really does, it draws on all kinds of authors, many of whom have been in Afghanistan or Iraq, um, uh, veterans, in other words, uh, who sense, see in the experience of the Great War, their, their own experience. Um, and I am in there. And I think this is where I can say that this is, I think, where my writing is these days. <laughs> I made a really big mistake. I took the free offer to sign up for Ancestry.com. And then I took the free offer for the secondary use of newspapers.com. And that was like three years ago. <laughs> I, I, I'm still, I'm still, now I'm paying for it. You know, it just shows up on my credit card. And I go, oh, okay, I'll stay with it. Right. Uh, partly because now that I no longer have to serve um, the, the need to increase my salary by publishing, right? Or I used to be to get your tenure, right? I don't have to, it's not a professional thing anymore. I'm really inhabiting more and more uh, a personal space or a personal dimension. But my start with that was this particular article right here 
I'll put that up like that. Um, my my opa, my gross fatty, right, was a prisoner of war in Japan from 1914 to 1919. And he came back with an envelope full of photographs. And my father would talk about these photographs, how he and his, uh, <laughs> he and his brother, Winfried, oh man, his older brother's name was Winfried and my father's name was Conrad. What did they get called? Wimp and Connie. <laughs> Wimp and Connie. You know, they, they, they survived it. My dad had the scars to show it too. But he said, we would go up and we would look at these photographs. Well, I'm not going to, this is the real reason to see this. I, I, I got absorbed with these too, because what I'm really fascinated by is that threshold between personal experience and larger history. And here's a picture taken by a Japanese photographer in Tsingdao, Qingdao, in China in 19... 13, just before the war broke out, uh, of my, my grandfather, who was, he was at the garrison, the German garrison at Tsingdao. Have you ever had the beer? Have you ever wondered why Chinese beer comes from Tsingdao? It's because the Germans put a brewery there, right? It was the largest single German colonial investment, was to try to come up with a city on the Chinese coast that would compete with the British at Hong Kong. And my grandfather was in the second Zay Battalion of the, of the Wehrmacht, right, during the First World War. The Japanese wanted it badly. The Japanese wanted it badly. They overran the town and took my grandfather prisoner, uh, prisoner one day before the surrender, as a matter of fact. And then they took him to Japan and they kept him in a prison camp for five years. Mm -hmm. And of course, as soon as everybody hears that, they think of the Second World War. And the baton death match, and no, uh -uh. the Japanese loved the Germans. Right at that particular period, they were building a modern army based on the German model. Okay, so that in fact, as prisoners of wars, prisoners of war go, he was pretty well treated. This picture, though, has written on the back of it, right, to my dear friend from her sweetheart in China. So my grandfather was in a prison camp in Japan for five years while he had a fiance back home in Germany. Um, the other photographs are ones that really sort of suggest a different, a different kind of world. One that is in particular my father remembers is uh, this one, right? You can't see anything. I'll have to describe it to you. It's a picture, it's a kind of a, it's, it, 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 it's a picture of Japanese officers standing around the bodies of dead Chinese who have been decapitated. Okay, yeah. yeah. And uh, my, my dad said that in a way you're sort of like, um, it, was a, it was a very peculiar experience as a child saying, why does my grandfather, why does my father, my fati, why does he have this? He had a little less difficulty. There are some others in here. Oh, I can't show these in church, right? <laughs> there are naked women from Samoa. Right? That's all you get. Right? <laughs> and of course, you know, that's, well, that's a no brainer, but there, but there they were. There was actually, there is a, a family story, as a matter of fact, that when my grandfather finally did get back to, uh, uh, to uh, Germany and get married, um, the inflation was starting in Germany, fascism was coming on. He says, I'm getting, I'm out of here with my family. They almost went to Samoa, right? It was, it was actually, I would look very different if they had gone to Samoa. Right? And this, I'll just read two, two sentences. This is the last picture in it. It's a picture from 1950. The fat baby on his lap is yours truly, right? And uh, I can say this about it. Um, this is a picture of him with the author, Centerline, Michigan, in 1950. My opa's mother had died when he was a child. His father was remote and his stepmother, a martinet. He was sent from the family's rough rural cottage in Pomerania to an apprenticeship with a carpenter at an early age. I remember him smelling of snuff, a quiet and melancholy man, an old soldier who was extraordinarily tender to his grandchildren. So I think that uh, um, what I'm really finding at this point is that writing begins to cut the line between 
I don't need to worry about anybody reading it anymore if I don't feel like it's something I want anybody to read. So it has gotten to a point, and I think this is the best part of writing, is where it is the process. I would disagree with Melody. I kind of hate it when it's done. It's not supposed to finish, right? Um, I did find a box, because Lisa's read almost nothing of what I've written. I did find a box, you know, we moved 14 months ago and I'm beginning to unpack my books, right? And this was just a box full of stuff that I'd written, right? I mean, every, I picked up one that was 30 years old and I started to read it with a little trepidation. I got, oh heck, I wrote better then than I do now. <laughs> but anyway, so anyhow, thank you very much for this a, a nice idea. I appreciate it. And yeah, and you can get it on Amazon. You really can if you want to. Oh, that's the really wonderful thing. It's from an independent press, and there is it's from an independent press, and there is a, a, a publisher, uh, the distributor. This is the second best-selling historical book on the independent publications wow. last, last week, right? Wow. So it's going great times. Right? Mm -hmm. Might have something to do with the fact that there are 30 authors in there. And so we know there are at least 30, 30 at least 30, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. I, this has uh, exceeded my expectations and I appreciate all of the personal stories and just the variety of writing and meaning and how it plays out. And I know we're, pretty much out of our time, but if anybody wants to stay a little longer, we'll open the floor for questions. So thank you again, all of you, and you, Mary Lou, and Melody, too.